It's time for us to begin our midweek uh, Bible study together. A few announcements before we do that. Uh, a few folks to keep in prayer. We have good news tonight. Sister Aquila Butler is now back at home with Annette. And so that's, that's good news after about uh, oh, 10, 12 days, maybe two weeks in the hospital. She is back home where she belongs, and we're thankful for that. Uh, keep in your prayers, Maud Hornsby. This is Sharon O'Brien's cousin. She's been diagnosed with, uh, I believe it's stage three lymphoma. It's pretty serious. And they're trying to get that addressed. Also, Brother Dan Winkler, who many of you know, he has spoken for us, taught for us on a number of occasions. Dan was diagnosed just this last week, as I understand it, with colon cancer. And I don't have any more details than that. Don't know how far along it is, but I do know that they're trying to get him uh, scheduled for surgery. I think as soon as possible. And Cheryl Richards, who is the wife of uh, Brother Scott Richards, and I believe it was uh, his folks were members here some years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago. Cheryl uh, has been diagnosed with a tumor, I believe, in her brain and uh, is currently scheduled, I believe, for surgery next Thursday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. And there's a, a understand pretty good likelihood that it may be malignant. So uh, do keep uh, the Richards family in your prayers, as well as the harps. The Terra congregations had some hard knocks all at once here. Brother Richard is, uh, as far as I know, still at Emory waiting to go to rehab and uh, after a stroke. Forrest Chapman is not feeling well, and he's not up to uh, phone calls or visits, but uh, your cards and certainly your prayers would be very much appreciated. A number of our folks still uh, dealing with COVID at, uh, on one level or another. Brett Rose, Larry's son, is, uh, I guess, isolated at college with it somewhere in New England. And uh, Jim and Eileen Scoma, the last word I have is that they're both still in the hospital here. Uh, she was hoping to go home shortly, and Jim was going to have to stay a little bit longer, but uh, she was improving, and I think he is too. So keep the Scomas in your prayers, as well as Tom and Christy Belk. They're both isolated at home with COVID. And uh, Sue Riley's brother over in Monroe, Georgia, Albert Mitchell. Uh, also, want to keep in mind Brother Steve Burdett. Bless his heart, he's got shingles and he's trying to recover from that, but that's, that's never fun. You can always uh, ask Sister Doris Buckner about that. Uh, there's nothing, nothing fun about that. Do remember, if you're the parent of a uh, middle or high schooler, to check and make sure that they got their new class book from Jonah, Out With Doubt by Kyle Butt. If they haven't, they need to get in touch with him and get a copy of that because they're about to begin that new study. Uh, and uh, I know there were some other announcements on Sunday pertaining to uh, Bible Bowl practice and lad leaders and so forth. Suffice it to say that, that uh, things are not yet back to normal, uh, normal being what we left behind a year ago. But Lord willing, we're moving in that direction. Baby steps right now, but we'll get there. Uh, do keep in mind, Sister Susie and Brother Denny are away this week. So if you call the church office, uh, if anybody's here, you're liable to get me or maybe Jonah. But uh, if you need anything, you can certainly, uh, you can call my cell phone and get in touch with me that way. And they'll be back, Lord willing, on Sunday. So keep them in your prayers as they travel. Don't have any uh, other announcements to mention. Uh, do remember Sister Debbie Decker and Kathy Gulledge also as they undergo their treatments uh, for cancer and all of those others that are undergoing cancer treatments of one sort or another. That's, that's, that's such, a, such a horrible thing to have to go through. On a, on a happy note, at least in my house, my wife actually went to work in her office today. So that's a good thing. Uh, that's all the announcements I have. So if you would, J.D., would you lead us in prayer? And then we'll have Brother Paul bring us our devotional. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the state that you've given us. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you have blessed us with. Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for this avenue of technology that we have to be able to come together, not in person, but uh, collectively as a whole in spirit. We are so thankful for those uh, advancements and technologies that we can do this, that we can study your word and still fellowship with one another, albeit at a distance. 
Father, we ask that you be with those that Brother Dave mentioned tonight that are sick. There's a whole list that, uh, from our congregation that need your healing hand. Father, we ask you watch over them. We ask you watch over those that are taking care of them, that they may do so to the best of their abilities. And if it be your will, Father, that they be restored to a portion of their health, that they may be able to return to Bible study and to worship with us. Father, we ask that you be with the Fat Hill congregation as we continue to persevere through this pandemic and that we all um, continue to support and encourage one another. We ask that you be with us tonight, that you be with uh, our leaders in, in this country, that they may look to you and not to their own understanding. Father, again, we just ask that you watch over us, uh, prepare our minds for your study and forgive us of our sins. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Brother Paul, it's all yours. I would uh, ask if you have a Bible handy, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and the first two verses of Hebrews 12, there are a very familiar wording in that that I want to read from the King James Version, and hopefully we can use that to get a thought tonight. That's Hebrews 12 and verses 1 and 2. And reading from King James, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. As I said, that's a very familiar passage, but I'm sure as we read it, we are all aware why there's a wherefore at the beginning of that passage. And we're also aware that there's a reference to being compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. It's obviously that what's being referred to is the Hall of Fame chapter, which is chapter 11 preceding this chapter. And in that chapter, men and women acted on their faith. And in most times, they acted under very trying circumstances. In verse one, as we read, the Hebrews writer, in my mind, is portraying those living under today's dispensation and, and picturing us as runners in an arena, contending in a race, and during which the vast host of heroes of faith watch and they watch the contest with Ian and they watch it from an encircled, elevated tier of an arena. I can picture those heroes of faith being filled with interest and sympathy and even compassion and encouragement for each runner. And then there's this statement given to each runner. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the rays that is set before us. Now, I don't know of a better passage to use this evening to encourage us in elevating our souls in view of eternity. Well, first of all, I can remember from my days of participating in sports that it was so very, very special to have loved ones cheering you on. It, it most definitely made you want to give it your best. And so it should be in the Christian raised. We ought to want to give it our best. We ought to strive to enter heaven, and especially knowing what so many before have endured. The comparison to running in a race is really should have been familiar to those back when these words were penned. But even today, it's obvious to us that no one runs a race carrying unnecessary weight. Or seeks to run in a path that's filled with stumbling blocks and debris. Instead, we would try to rid ourselves of all things that might weigh us down 
or that would impede our way. It should be no different with us as we navigate our way through life. We should cast aside whatever weighs us down, whether it's uh, affections or uh, heart problems or whatever our progress that would cause to be hindering to our progress and pleasing God. Notice that it said in that passage, every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Now, while sin most definitely will block our progress, we also have to lay aside every weight. I can remember a Bible class teacher I had as a young man, and he would always give this uh, statement when somebody asked a question of a practice that didn't have a thou shalt not in front of it, but it was something that was ill-advised for a Christian to participate in. He, he would say, it might not be a sin, but it, it most definitely is a weight. This, this Sunday, many of us are gonna watch a contest where the participants won't be carrying any extra weight. They, they're gonna be trying to give it their best and they won't carry anything onto that field that will deter them from giving it their best. And in that contest, the prize that they are seeking is of no comparison to heaven. And also only one team is going to win. In light of that, notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Paul said this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. See, Satan's job is to impede us from every which way he can. And he wants to keep us from ever even entering the race. But we have to place our focus on Jesus and not on man. He can remove and he will remove every weight and sin. Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven that's better known as the church in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And then in Acts 37 and 38, Peter used those keys. And in replying to those who cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and get this, for the remission of of sins. You can get rid of that weight. The same command that Peter gave then holds true today. And it's true for all who recognize their unsaved condition and want to be added to God's family. And then there may be someone listening tonight who already is a baptized believer, but you stumble and you've been weighed down by some distraction or some sin. Like the faithful Hall of Famers, we are compassionately cheering for you and encouraging you to get back in the race, that you'll be able to cast aside whatever is weighing you down and then allow us together to take it to the Lord in prayer. Now tonight, we can't sing a song like we usually do in the normal setting and encourage you, but, but please contact one of our elders, preachers, or any one of our members, and it'll be our pleasure to assist you in any way we can to get straight with God. Thank you for listening, and I'll turn it back into the hands of the prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity that has extended to each one of us 
to be able to come once again and listen to thy word and to be able to focus on, on how we can include it in our every daily life. There's so many of us that have been housebound and that we pray for all those that are unable to get out. We pray that this following months, this new virus, the virus will be defeated and that the shots will be off to everybody. We pray also at this time for our leadership of this congregation that they will find job going through the things that we've had to go through. We pray for Dave and that he will be able to present us a lesson tonight that we all can apply in our own everyday life and that we can use as we go forward in running the race, the race that there's only one thing that we really should do is hoping that we do what we have to do to win that race. Till the next time we have the opportunity to get together, be with each one of us. We pray for our sick, especially for our chaplain as he goes through this time, and that we give him some relief. We pray so many things for so many people. We pray for all our cancer victims and all those suffering other, other diseases that maybe we don't know exactly, but we ask you to relieve their pain. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Hugh. And thank you, Paul, for that good uh, devotional. Uh, I, I do want to, just before we get to our Bible class, I want to share something with you that I found just uh, quite amusing. Paul mentioned the uh, contest coming up this coming Sunday. I assume you meant the Super Bowl. And uh, I was very, very amused to hear, I don't remember the, the young quarterback's name, but it's, it's the youngster that's not Tom Brady. Uh, who uh, commented that he's not going to be intimidated just because the other guy has been in 150 Super Bowls before him. <laughs> and I thought that was, that was quite amusing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we are in a, a series of studies of why do we? Questions about the churches of Christ. And, and I want to emphasize, I want to try to emphasize every week when we when we talk about why do we, we're not talking about uh, we this brand of denomination or we this brand of church. We're, we're trying to, to refer simply to those who are trying to follow the New Testament, trying to be what we read about in our own Bibles. Well, that makes us a little bit different than a lot of the religious world around us and provokes questions. Why do we do this, do that? And when folks ask those questions, a lot of times, remember, they're asking from a a denominational brand name point of view. But tonight, I want to explore just a little bit. There's a lot more detail we could go into. But let's, uh, let's deal with why do we as Christians only sing in worship? In other words, why isn't there a, an organ, a piano, a band, a guitar, uh, what have you? Why do we only sing, just sing? And it may be that the first and most vivid impression for many visitors to our worship services relates to that very fact, to the absence of an organ, a piano, some kind of musical instrumentation. Uh, and it may not be as noticeable in a large congregation that sings well in harmony as it is in a smaller congregation. When, when I was a, a schoolboy in, in grade school, one of my cousins who uh, grew up in a denomination, came and spent a week with us when we were having vacation Bible school one summer, and she went to worship with us that Sunday morning, and uh, I don't remember the, the substance of the lesson. I was probably 10 or 11 years old, but uh, it did touch on the subject of using instruments and made the point that we don't have any, and afterwards, she said, oh, yes, you do. She's a year older than me. I heard them. I know they're here somewhere. And we walked all around the church building looking for the organ or the piano that she was just sure that she had heard. But in fact, what she heard was about 275 or 300 people all singing together 
gladly, enthusiastically in four-part harmony with each other, praising God. And that's, that's pretty impressive, pretty awe-inspiring. And it sometimes uh, makes that, that absence of any mechanical instruments maybe not quite so obvious when that's the case. But nevertheless, this is often uh, the, the most visible and the most audible difference for many visitors. Uh, that since most denominations use a choir accompanied by uh, various instruments of some sort, uh, instrumentation, uh, most of, in most of their musical worship, uh, the membership typically only sings one or two songs in most congregations in the denominational world. A uh, number of years ago, the, the father of the, the cousin that I just mentioned uh, made the comment when I asked him, I was learning about vocal harmony. I was probably about uh, 13 or 14 at that time. And, and I asked him, what part does he sing? Because he had a fairly low voice. And he said, well, I sing the silent part. And what I realized later is he doesn't sing at all in worship. The novelty, and that's what it is to a lot of our friends and family members who are not in the faith, the novelty of all vocal music and the absence of mechanical instrumentation raises questions for some of these folks, and rightly so. And they're entitled to an answer as to why do we do this? Why do we only sing? And they're not just entitled to an answer. They're entitled to a biblically accurate answer. And I'll just say, and I'm not trying to point fingers, but shame on saints who can't explain why we only sing after they've been in the faith 10, 20, 30, 40 years. By that time, they ought to know and be able to answer. And one other thing that comes up when we talk about this is the fact that uh, some congregations among us, as we would say, that is some who still have the name uh, or the, the description Church of Christ outside on their sign or on their building, who still identify themselves that way. There have been a few who have, as their elders and preachers have said, restudied the issue and decided that it's not a big deal and they've adopted the use of instruments. And they need to, their members at least, need to know why most congregations haven't followed their lead and why most Christians still see that choice as, frankly, as a sinful one, as one that they should not have made. But tonight, uh, I'd like for us to look at, at three simple principles in the scriptures and then try to make some practical applications by way of explaining why we, that is, folks who are just trying to be Christians, only sing without using any kind of uh, instrumental accompaniment, mechanical instrumental accompaniment. Uh, we only sing, reason number one, because Christians are instructed to respect Jesus as the head of his church. Now, you might recall if you were here last week that uh, we noted last week in Ephesians chapter 1 in uh, verses 18 through 22, that Jesus is described as the head of the body. And the body, of course, is the church. You might go back there and just look at Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, he says, beginning at verse 15, the English Standard Version, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, he's the head. That's the brains of the outfit, you might say. Our God, our Father, put him in that position above all other authorities, according to verses 21 and 22. Now, if you flip over to Colossians chapter 1 in verses 15, 16, and 17, there the Apostle Paul emphasizes that as the head, he is supposed to be preeminent. He's supposed to have preeminence. And what that means in, in cornbread terms is he's in first place in all the universe. After all, he created all things according to verse 16. So that just makes good sense. He's in first place. Now, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 goes on to show that that preeminence in all things includes preeminence or first place in the church. So that in all things, including the church, he may have preeminence. He may be in first place even in the church. Now, since he's in heaven, and not here on earth with us in physical fleshly form, since he's in heaven, according to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he acts as head through his word, through the new covenant, and he's the mediator of that covenant, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, and chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. Now, that new covenant, his word, shows, first of all, how God saves people. It shows us how he does it. Through his son who first spoke the great salvation. Uh, just all you have to do is look at Hebrews chapter 2 uh, verses 1 through 4 there. And he has shown us through the son how we are to be saved. But it also shows the word shows us how those whom he saves are meant to worship. And again, we could go to Hebrews chapter 8 and look at verses 10, 11, and 12, and chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 in general principle. But it also, that word shows us how those whom he saves are supposed to live. Hebrews chapters 12 and 13 are all about that. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, a familiar passage for us, and in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, a parallel passage, the head of the church. Jesus, through the inspired writers, through the Spirit, the Comforter whom he sent, says that we Christians are to sing. Let's read the verses together. Begin at Ephesians 5 and verse 19, and the English Standard Version here says, addressing one another. The King James, I think, says speaking to one another. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, making melody in your heart to the Lord, the older translations say. Now you go over to Colossians chapter three and there the King James version, I've got both of them open here for convenience, says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, in those verses, the head of the church tells us that we're to sing, accompanied by the participation or the use of the heart, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, it's worth pointing out over in Hebrews chapter 2, in verses 11 and 12, that when we sing in worship, you know what else happens? That same head, the Lord, our Savior, sings with us. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, and notice what he says in verses 11 and 12. The English Standard Version says, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. He goes on again uh, in verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, 
I and the children God has given me. Now, he's this, the Hebrews writer there is actually quoting from the Psalms, where the psalmist writes prophetically of the Christ. But notice what he said. I will sing of them in the congregation. That is, when we sing, he sings. Because our head, our teacher, our savior, commanded, he specified singing. And those instructions, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3 are in the imperative uh, form. They are commandments. Because he specified singing, that means we're not free to add guitar, trap set, drums, uh, a harmonica, an organ, a piano, a band and still be able to sing in the name of the Lord. We, we, can, we have the ability to do all of that, to add those things, but we can't do it and legitimately still claim that we're singing in the name of the Lord. In other words, with his approval, having done as we were told. If we do that, we're doing something we were not told to do. Now, number two, number one, Christ is the head of the church, and the head said, sing. Number two, Christians only sing uh, because we are to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And there's more to singing than the mere mechanics of pitch and harmony and rhythm and voice. There's more to singing than simply what we do with our voices, making sounds, or if you're, uh, if you're singing in sign, uh, making sounds with your hands, so to speak, uh, signing with your hands. Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, show us that it's the heart, the mind or spirit of the worshiper that must also be engaged, must also be involved in order for our singing to be what the Lord told us to do. Simply singing the songs, making the sounds, even in perfect pitched harmony, is not all there is to it. If the heart is not engaged, if the spirit's not involved, it may be beautiful sound, but that's all it is. It's not worship. That's what Jesus was getting at when he told the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 and verse 24 that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit, that is with the engagement of the, the spirit, and in truth, that is according to what he reveals to us, what he has expressed to us in his word. We only are able to connect with God in our worship, and this is as true of our worship in prayer or in the Lord's Supper, or in our offerings, or in the, the study of the Word. We're only able to engage or connect with God in worship when our hearts are involved. If your heart's not in it, it ain't worship. And it's really just about that simple. Now, uh, I do want to take note of the fact that uh, some folks try and even some of so-called our folks have tried to justify uh, using or adding uh, instruments, mechanical instruments, man-made instruments in worship for a variety of reasons. Now, I want you to think with me here for a minute. That word justify is a key word because it means that what they're trying to do is they're trying to prove that it's right. Well, why? Why would somebody try to prove that that's right? The answer is simple, because they want to use them. And that word sums it all up. They want it. So they're trying to justify it, trying to prove that, it's, that it has God's approval. And the reasons that they put forward, let me give you some samples. Reason number one, well, God's people in the Old Testament, used instruments in addition to their singing. Simple question. Do we live under the authority of the Old Testament laws, either patriarchal or mosaic? 
with their required animal sacrifices, with the, the segregated Levitical priesthood, with uh, the use of harps in the worship and dancing, as we find in Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 and 21? Or do we live under the better covenant of Christ as our head? We don't live under both. That's a mistake that much of Christendom makes is to, to try to jam everything together and call it all one. It's not. It's two separate distinct covenants. Most folks in the, in the religious community never stop to wonder, why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament? The Hebrews writer explains it. Where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. It doesn't take effect until the one who made it dies. The old died when the one who made it was crucified and a new one takes its place and endures forever because he'll never die again. Do we live under that Old Testament law? It's a rhetorical question. No, we don't. We don't have animal sacrifices. We don't have a Levitical priesthood. We don't have a temple in Jerusalem. We don't have these other things. Why would we want to then import something they used without importing all of it. James tells us in James chapter four that if we keep the whole law yet offend in one point, we're as guilty as if we had offended in every point. The whole book of Hebrews from chapter one through chapter 13 is designed to show that the new covenant, the covenant that Jesus has given us is different from the old covenant and better than the old covenant. So why would we refer back to something that is inferior and outmoded and no longer in effect to try to justify something that the new covenant doesn't authorize? Reason number two. First, they say, well, God's people used it in the Old Testament. They, they made animal sacrifices and all sorts of other things that we don't do. Why this one thing? doesn't make sense. Reason number two, well, you know, using, using instruments, using a, a piano or having an organ or even having a praise band, that's, that's no different than having songbooks or having electric lights in the, in the church building or, or having pews to sit on or even having a church building. But the logic does not track here. It is different because songbooks and lights, uh, pews to sit on, a, a roof over our heads. Those are all things that can facilitate our worship, our singing. They make it easier, but they don't take the place of it. They don't add anything to it in terms of the character of the worship. A piano, an organ, a guitar, a drum set, those add something to our singing, and the fact of the matter is they often overshadow it. It was interesting to me to have the opportunity 40-odd years ago to visit the British Museum in London and to read there in a display of uh, Middle English, that is uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century English musical instruments, sackbuts and, and so forth, uh, a little placard on the wall that uh, made the point that in I believe it was Westminster Abbey, may have been in Yorkminster in the north of England, that these instruments had been adopted in the, the worship of the church, the congregation in that particular place. Now, we know that was a, a denominational body because it was the Church of England at that point. Henry VIII had broken from the Catholic denomination. But nevertheless, the, the placard went on to say that the musicians that were hired to perform on these instruments in order to draw in young people in the community, uh, soon found that they could not resist jazzing up the, the music. And that uh, ran contrary to what the priest had hired them to do. And so after several months of this, he fired them and replaced them with an organ because he could control the organist, or he couldn't control the whole band. They add something to the singing and often overshadow it. 
where a songbook is silent. Electric lights are silent. Reason number three, it's not just they used it in the Old Testament. And it's not just, well, it's, it's, just, an adi- it's, it's just an aid. No, it's not. It's, it's an addition. But reason number three, what we might call scholarly excuse number one, is that the, the Greek word solo, P-S-A-L-L-O, there in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, well, that word refers to plucking the strings of a musical instrument. Historically, that's what it, what it means, and so that's, that's what it has to mean here. Well, historically, yes, that is what it meant. In classical Greek usage, which is in the days of, of Socrates and Plato and even Aristotle, but they all lived three to 800 years before the first century. And you know, if we've learned nothing in the last generation, we've learned that the meanings of words change. When you hear the word G-A-Y, gay, in the 21st century, what context does it immediately have? A gay guy in the 21st century is not the same thing as a gay guy a hundred years ago in the 20th century. That meant that he was happy and celebrating then. Now it means that he has a certain predilection with respect to sex. That is the dominant meaning of the word, but the word has changed in its meaning. So also the Greek word solo. Yes, historically and originally, it meant specifically to pluck or to twang as you would pluck the strings of a a musical instrument, a harp, a lyre, a guitar, a violin, something like that. But you trace the etymology of the word, and you find that by the time of the first century, it was used exclusively of singing. See, it went from playing an instrument to playing and singing to singing in its common usage. Scholarly context is everything here, because the meaning of that word is determined by the time frame when it was being used. And it wasn't being used in classical Greek in the Bible. It was being used in the first century where it meant to sing. And the meaning is determined by the context. What is it? If you want to talk about instruments, what is it that is to be plucked or twanged in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, Colossians chapter 3? The head of the church identifies the instrument. If you want to put an instrument here, the head of the church has identified the instrument that Christians are to play. Read Ephesians 5 and verse 19 again. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and soloing, making melody in your heart, with your heart, as the English Standard Version says, to the Lord. The singer's heart would be the instrument that is to be plucked or twanged or what have you. Now, if a humanly created instrument is required because we use this word, and that's the contention of the the folks that are trying to be scholarly about it, an organ, a tambourine, something like that. By the way, would a percussion instrument qualify because it's not plucked or twanged, it's smacked. I guess that leaves out tambourines, doesn't it? Drums. If a humanly created instrument is inherent in this word, then it's not optional. It's required. Because this doesn't say singing or making melody in your heart. It says singing and. Just like repent and be baptized. doesn't say repent or be baptized. You put the two together. It's not either or. So it's not optional, but required if that includes a humanly created instrument. And not only is it not optional, it's also required for every single worshiper, not one or not just a band or not just those who are skillful. That means if an instrument's required, 
It's required for everybody. Wow, can you imagine the cacophony of sound there? I know some folks, fine Christian folks, but their musical talent is such that they can't even play the radio. Can you imagine what worship would be like under that circumstance? A second so-called scholarly reason, or we'd call it a scholarly excuse, uh, goes back to the Psalms and says, well, Old Testament Psalms were, were written to be sung with instruments. They were designed to be sung with instruments, and, and instruments are referenced in the later Psalms, and therefore we can use instruments. Well, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 is an instruction that applies to all Christians. What did he say? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, if that argument that psalms include instruments so we can use them, if that argument is true, then even Jesus, who sings with us from heaven, remember, even he would need one because all of us would be obligated to use them. Now, a simple observation is in order here. God never gives a command without also giving the ability to obey it. And he did. If you want to put an instrument into this, he did give us an instrument, the heart. And that's what's in the context here. We're to sing with grace in our hearts, not the blood pump, but our, our mind, our spirit. That's the biblical heart. So if you want an instrument, well, God gave you one. Use the one he gave. One final argument that sometimes is advanced. Well, the Bible doesn't say not to. It amazes me that folks, grown people, can offer that argument with a straight face. Well, the Bible doesn't say not to. This is what's called the argument from silence, but this example of it is not really a, an example of the argument from silence. There is an argument to be made, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Children try this all the time. Sometimes poor parenting on the part of the parents lets it slide. Well, yeah, I guess you're right. I didn't tell you not to do that. You didn't tell me not to throw rocks at the windows. You didn't tell me not to shoot my BB gun at the front door. And as parents, we look at this and say, do I really, are, are you really that dumb? Do I really have to tell you, don't do this? Is that not self-evident? But if the head of the church has specified both what to do and how to do it in worship, when it comes to worshiping in song, that is, to sing, which is the voice, and to sing from the heart, that's the mind, the spirit. Let's just ask a, a question here. Has he actually been silent on the subject? Can we make an argument from silence? You didn't tell me not to. That's not an argument from silence because he has not been silent on the subject at all. He has prescribed exactly what to do and exactly how to do it. If a band or an orchestra is justified by the fact that, well, the Lord didn't tell us not to, then why, why, is, why are we not justified to build some bowling lanes over in the, the other building and, and throw the doors open and get a camera crew in and start shooting episodes of bowling for dollars as a, a means of funding the church's work. The Lord didn't tell us not to. He just told us to give. He didn't tell us we couldn't also do that. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Why not have rock concerts with $100 a head tickets? By the way, you know, some of the denominations are doing exactly that sort of thing. They usually put it in an arena and call it a, a conference, but that's exactly what's going on. In Hebrews chapter 7, in verses 11 through 14, the inspired writer does use the silence of the scriptures to show that Jesus could not be an earthly 
Levitical Old Testament priest if he were still here with us in person physically because he's from the wrong tribe in Israel. We go back to Galatians chapter 4. We know that he was born of a woman born under the law in the fullness of time. We know that he kept the law perfectly. There was no guile found in his mouth, according to Peter, not even uh, the slightest deception. He kept every requirement of the law flawlessly. If he were to serve as a priest in this world, he would be violating the law because it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, concerning which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priests. He came from Judah, verse 14. Because God did specify who could be priests under the Old Testament's law, he didn't have to say, oh, and all of you from the tribe of Judah, you can't be priests. When he specified what he did want, he ruled out everything else. Now, in the time we have left, let's, let's try to apply some specific principles in the New Testament with respect to singing in our worship. Why do we only sing? Because we're trying to respect the authority, the instruction of our, our head, our Savior, because he authorized us to sing and make melody in our hearts, with our hearts, to him. Some specific principles to think about. It is specifically a command that we sing and make melody in our hearts. Paul identifies everything that is to accompany the voice of the singer here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now, well, that's just two verses out of hundreds. Yeah, those are not the only verses, but those are the most obvious verses. And we might just ask, how many times does God have to say something before it is incumbent upon us, before it binds us, before it's obligatory? One time? Three times? Ten times? A hundred times? I think we'd all agree. If we have any respect for the scriptures at all, once is enough. And yet he's not said it just once, but several times. Adding something that's not here in these verses is no different than what King Saul did back there in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul added something that the Lord did not authorize him to do. It rejects the commandment of the head of the church when we add something to our singing and our making melody in the heart. Saul added something to what God had said. In fact, he actually violated what God said by keeping, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Agag alive and flocks and herds. Oh, to offer a sacrifice, we're going we're gonna to give this as sacrifice to the Lord. That wasn't what the Lord instructed him to do. Using instruments, human instruments, that's not what the Lord instructed us to do. Jesus was plain. And I find it ironic that Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us, let the word of Christ, let the word of the head of the church dwell in you richly. Let it live richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. But he doesn't stop there. Go on and read verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is, by his authority, with his permission, with his authorization, giving thanks to God and the Father by him or through him. It is a specific command. Principle number two, the participation of the heart requires the impression come before the expression. What do you mean by that? Well, in other words, for this to be what Jesus describes, what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write, my mind has to be engaged and committed to praising the Lord and honoring his will. For my words, 
my singing to be acceptable worship. It's what we said a minute ago. If my heart's not in it, if my mind is not engaged, if the spirit is not involved, it may be beautiful, but it's just noise. It's not worship. Principle number three, sometimes folks will say, you know, singing without instruments, that's just Church of Christ doctrine, or that's just our tradition, as some of our folks will sometimes say. And that's not true. Number one, it's not Church of Christ doctrine, because there is no such thing as Church of Christ doctrine. Sometimes some of our uh, jaded, soured, biblically ignorant brothers and sisters will say, well, there certainly is a Church of Christ doctrine, because they're thinking as Christendom does, as the denominational world does, as some of their friends and neighbors do, not from a biblical point of view, but they're thinking of the Lord's body from a denominational point of view, as if Church of Christ is just a brand name, but it's not. We can be what we read about in the New Testament, or we can be part of the denominational world, but we can't be both because the one excludes the other. And it doesn't matter which way you're going with that. Either the New Testament church excludes denominationalism or denominationalism excludes the New Testament church. You can't have both together. It's not our tradition. How do we describe singing only? There's a Latin phrase that's associated with it, a capella. It's two words, it's not one. Capella is the Latin word for chapel, and a cappella, as in the chapel. It's a figure of speech that basically says, as it used to be done, as it was done even in the denominational community prior to the introduction of instruments in the Middle Ages. The tradition, if there is any tradition, is what was received from those who wrote the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. Not what was handed down by our grandparents or our great-grandparents who were poor that couldn't afford a piano or something like that. You know, the fact of the matter is when folks are determined to do things the way they want to, the way that pleases them, instead of according to the instructions that the Lord has given, then the reasoning for it really doesn't matter. They're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to do what they insist on. And that's what we see throughout Christendom, all the various and conflicting and contradicting denominations. Sadly, a very small portion of those associated with churches of Christ, with the, the plea to go back to the Bible, have abandoned that line of reasoning to go back to the Bible and adopted the line of reasoning that the rest of the world uses. We like it, so we're going to do it. But that doesn't excuse it, and that doesn't justify it. Why do we only sing instead of using instruments or a band or a, 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 an organ or something for the simple reason that we want to honor the head of the body, do what he's told us. And he's told us what to do. And when we've done that, we've fulfilled his will. Well, that's where we'll stop tonight. And uh, we have uh, about a minute left in our allotted time. If you have a question or a comment, feel free. And if not, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. And if not, then we'll uh, dismiss with a word of prayer. And then we'll stop the recording. And we'll have time to visit and socialize. All right. Well, let's take a moment and pray together. Heavenly Father, our God, we're grateful and thankful to you that you have given us such a gorgeous day. Father, we have so enjoyed the the beauty of your creation today, and we thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for this time that we can be together in, in this format and discuss and, and study and, and worship together and be aware of one another and catch up with each other. 
Father, help us to be encouraged by being in one another's company, even in this format. We pray for your church, Father, wherever she's found in this world. We pray for our brothers and sisters that in the face of strife in some places, and conflict and pandemic and sickness and poverty in other places, that they would be encouraged and strong and faithful so that the, the body of, of your son might grow and flourish in spite of all the challenges that this world presents. Again, Father, we beg for your blessings of comfort and ease for our folks who are sick, especially for those who are aged and, and approaching the, the transition from this life into eternity. Father, we ask your comfort for them. We pray for our folks who are being treated for cancer and ask that their side effects might be minimized as much as possible and that the treatment would be successful. We ask you, Father, to bless our elders as they watch over us and give them wisdom. Bless our new president and his administration and help them to, to govern justly and righteously. Help us to encourage and support them in everything that's right. Father, we know that we fall short, that we sin and stumble, and we beg you to forgive us as we repent. And we thank you for giving us time to repent. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. And we pray all of these things in his precious name. Amen.